Uh, thank you, Mark, so much for having me. And I am not uh, so much a public speaker. I try to be a public writer a bit. And um, like Fred, I'm writing a bit about, more about the process of how architecture writing gets into print. And um, I'm thrilled, though, to have seen Jan Abrams' uh, early years of Blueprint, because now I can blame star architecture on her. <laughs> <laughs> no, not you. Well, <laughs> and uh, with all those headshots on the covers, and obviously they became inflated personalities in our lives. Um, however, one of my points being that uh, the writing about architecture has devolved to so much about objects and images has been totally undercut by all the fantastic speakers here today, which I'm thrilled to see. But, um, and I want, first of all, to get um, the PowerPoint out of the way, because um, uh, people think about architecture critics as these very magisterial or uh, you know, obsessive or indulgent characters. This happens to be uh, Waldo Leidecker from the movie Laura, 1944. And hardly less sinister is uh, uh, Ellsworth Toey from The Fountainhead. And, <laughs> but, but really, writing about architecture and critics are, are nothing like this. And I'm just going to leave this slide here while I talk. <laughs> and then when I get to Architects newspaper, of course, we'll come alive again. Um, and I'm really going back in history a bit uh, to talk about writing in architecture. In Lost Illusions, when Balzac, uh, to write about the process of how things get into print and how the public uh, really isn't aware of how much of it works. Uh, in Lost Illusions, when Balzac wrote about journalism and printing in the mid-19th cent century, he revealed an insidious but inf uh, efficient mechanism. Actresses paying off for profiles, editors demanding extra review copies for resale, which still happens, uh, critics from opposing newspapers fabricating controversy to up sales. It was entirely invisible to the public. Though less rude and colorful and corrupt, journalism today, including architecture journalism, is still an insidiously efficient operation. And I imagine the public may not be entirely aware of how external mechanisms continue to shape of much, much of what turns up in print, even in some of the grandest publications. And uh, writing about the city today is more intimately than ever entwined with image production, getting photos, getting them first, getting them original. And in many cases, those images are under the control of people who want to influence the message. Quite often, getting smart architectural, getting smart architectural coverage is really just part of someone's marketing plan. Uh, and it's, it's really in the service of publicists. And it'd be nice if uh, writing about architecture could get back to uh, not so much servicing the publicists as the public. And I'm thinking of a, right now, I can draw back the curtain a la Balzac a bit on uh, one such project. The, new Museum of Contemporary Art, as a lot of people here, a lot of the writers here will know, is opening on December 1st. Uh, it's in the, on the Bowery in Manhattan, uh, and maybe some of you from Syracuse will come down. But it will be met with enormous hoopla that's anything but spontaneous. Every nuance of its public reception has already been carefully orchestrated. Its arrival, like the debut of a new prima ballerina in Balzac's day, or the new iPhone or American gangster film in ours, will occasion an enormous huzzah, where any peep of criticism is easily drowned out by the celebration of the new for its own sake. This process of build-up takes years, and for the new museum, I was even part of it. Uh, at the New York Times in 2003, I got the call offering me the chance to write about it, and uh, if I, I could write about who the architects chosen for the job, Sana, would be, and I would be told on Monday, no, I was told on Friday, and if I published on Monday, they would then let everyone else know on Tuesday. And that's pretty much, I had my copy of the uh, uh, Nouvelle Commission going for MoMA, uh, written up in today's page one image uh, in the New York Times, and that's exactly how that would have worked. Uh, so when I get that call, and it's a standard way of working, you know, the first thing I would say is, is, is there a picture? Because obviously, um, well, not obviously, but uh, the point being that with a picture, there can be a reaction. And if without a picture, it's simply straight publicity. Uh, of course, the building at that point is just pie in the sky anyway, a rendering at best. 
Still, it's enough to start the snowball of excitement and of celebration and praise for a piece of the city that doesn't even exist yet. Now, four years later, it's a much bigger deal. Millions have been spent on construction. There's something there, there, under the scaffolding and black netting, something like a Christmas present. Next month, many upscale magazines will carry the news of the new museum. Vogue, Wired, Met Home, Dwell, Departures. They're not magazines that everyone will see, but it'll be enough to, to spread the word, or as Vogue's to so tantalizing saying, you know, what people are talking about. And of course, for anyone who gets their fingernails polished, those December issues come out in early November. So that means all those articles were edited, put together, sometime in August. So that means <laughs> that very few, if any, of the people writing those very positive articles will have ever seen the building at all. They will write from renderings and press releases. The tome will thus be necessarily brief and complimentary, the substance of cocktail banter. No, because nothing is based on experience, the buzz is almost always positive. Enter the architecture critics. Now, as probably some of you here, two, two or three weeks ago, they were given the opportunity, and even now, maybe some of you are, are about to see it or have just seen it, uh, are invited into a, an elaborate dance with the institution, both paying court and subtly manipulating those who write about the city and new buildings. The museum director or the principal architect will personally escort a handful of top critics deemed especially influential. Lesser critics and reporters are assigned to pack tours led by curators or staff architects. Tours might last as long as an hour. A prominent British critic once told me that 20, 20 minutes was all he needed. It's not a restaurant review after all, where you come in in disguise and eat several meals. The art might not even entirely be in place. It might not even be there at all. New buildings are often reviewed empty before the general public has ever set foot in them. The critic may like or dislike the building, argue that it works aesthetically or fails its context, but whether or not it does the job for which it was built remains pure conjecture. But as far as the client is concerned, mission accomplished in making the new building an event and a photo opportunity. Too often, writing about the cities today is, a, is largely predetermined in that way, even pre-scripted, with the voice of, when there certainly is good criticism, and all of them are in this, many of them are in this room, but it's usually muted by the waves of praise that have been generated in advance. Uh, back in 1936, it was with considerable prescience that Lewis Mumford, oh yes, and I wanted to show how Lewis Mumford kind of looks like that guy from the Fountainhead. <laughs> <laughs> Back in 1936, with considerable prescience, Lewis Mumford, writing the architecture column The Skyline for The New Yorker, did not allow the use of photographs with his words in order to force readers to go see places for themselves. For Mumford, architecture was an index of the health of civilizations. His real interest was in being a social philosopher, with architecture as really no more than a benchmark, more than a benchmark than an end in itself. Star architecture would not have had a chance with Mumford, who did not buy the art and architecture argument at all, and once wrote, and I'm quoting, if I can make a discriminating aesthetic judgment about the design of a modern lunchroom, I could perhaps handle Michelangelo or Le Corbusier. In fact, when the New Yorker first invited him to write about architecture, he submitted a column by a colleague at the Regional Planning Association, which he actually helped to uh, found, something that would be anathema in today's conflict of interest uh, focused journalism. Uh, and she happened to be his mistress as well. He did not take very seriously his role as, he, he did take very seriously his role as an advocate of the public realm and giving priority to urban fabric over individual structures. In the 30s, he wrote that the best building is is one of those structures which one may pass a hundred times without really noticing if they are good or bad. And then famously, he called Rockefeller Center the sorriest failure of the imagination and intelligence in modern American architecture. So much for judgment calls. But when, arch but when architects wrote in to complain of his anti-architectural bias, New York, the New Yorker editor Harold Ross defended his critic. And he shot back. I don't have to go to a theatrical production if I don't want to, or a moving picture, or look at a painting, or at worst, I can walk away from these things. But a building is there, and I've got to look at it. And realization of this sad fact makes me indignant and downright bitter. 
And it was one of my ambitions when we started The New Yorker to, for God's sakes, do something about it because nobody else seemed to be doing anything in a popular, product, in a popular publication. And that seems to be as good an argument now as it was then. In the 40s, when Mumford made one of his repeated attempts to quit, Ross prevented him, saying, you are all the leadership that architecture of today is getting now, and it's your duty to go on. Clearly, by focusing on the urban environment rather than specific buildings, Mumford did something which writers today don't seem to be able to pull off. He earned the trust and appreciation of the reading public. These days, there seemed to be an almost, in those days, there seemed to be an almost pedantic sense of the public duty that's lacking, perhaps not even necessary in contemporary reported reportage and criticism, where so-called service journalism is even perceived as slightly down market. I came across this interesting uh, kind of example of this in a 1946 MoMA exhibition catalog for a show organized by Elizabeth B. Mock, who was then architecture curator and has been largely written out of the books entirely. But she did an impressive housing show that included a, a truly Catholic combination of modernist and regional architects, including Gropius and Lautner, Wright, John Funk of Modesto, Mies Neutra Frey, William Worcester, Ed Stone, Kurt Barrett of Norwich, Vermont, and F.J. McCarthy of Berkeley. But the most interesting thing, uh, more interesting still, was that the catalog included a postscript saying that the Federal Housing Authority uh, did not insure loans on non-traditional housing, but you could send for a pamphlet for five cents called Modern Design and, sh and shake it in the face of local officials. But that's how the sense of duty that pervaded both journalistic writing and curators was much more deeply felt in those days. Everyone was an advocate. That's, and that spirit of serving the public continued with Otto Louise Huxtable, who started writing about architecture for the New York Times in the late 1950s. In 1958, she wrote, the art and science of building have never held more promise for the pre present or the future. It is a promise that cannot be kept, however, until we become more intelligently aware of the important role architects play. She concluded that the public often failed to understand the importance of architecture due to a lack of visual education, and she made it her job to go around describing what places looked like and felt to live in and to use. She measured success, she said, by the street corner. Ultimately, Huxtable was a key catalyst for the budding preservation movement. And more than her building reviews, which were always solid and often prescient, it is her observations of the functioning world. From noticing, and this Dean Rubin would probably be interested in, from noticing the zinnias that stubbornly flourished alongside the highway in a piece about service roads on and off the Bruckner Boulevard. And it was that which made her writing so accessible to the public and a high mark in writing about the city that has never really been reached again. In Kick to Building lately, her collected essays published in 1976, she reviews plenty of new buildings and topical exhibitions, but she also traveled to places that were entirely buzz-free to write about the vernacular texture of Marblehead, Massachusetts, or the absence of a there there in downtown Houston, not because there was a catastrophic flood or major new museum in town, but just because it was the fifth largest city in the U.S. in 1976, and she wanted to know what that looked like. However, she apparently, um, I heard recently, she wrote a um, story about economic development, economic, uh, she wrote some economic commentary praising the developer Gerald Hines for his genius at financial leveraging for the Pennzoil Towers and the uh, board of directors at the Times almost kicked her off the paper for daring to stray from aesthetic viewpoints. Uh, Huxtable's writing about a dawning age of self-discovery of cities may have been a tad over optimistic, while her bid for greater visual sophistication may have succeeded all too well, when you consider that the once great skyline column by Lewis Mumford has evolved from penetrating essays to a portrait photo of a new building with an extended caption. And while we're talking about personalities and architecture, I have to mention Herbert Machamp, if only briefly. Brilliant and passionate as he was, and had an incredible slide, but it, it's not gonna come up. <laughs> uh, Herbert simply didn't make enough sense on the job. And I would have to say that he frittered away some of the goodwill of general readers interested in the built environment, even as he provided some wildly entertaining think pieces about the relationship of our inner landscapes to the outer world. 
Which brings me finally to the architect's newspaper and to the note, whoops, oh, there is Herbert. Oh, there he is, oh man. Oh, I'm sorry, well, you can get, you can get the expression. <laughs> it just came out black before, but anyway, rest in peace, Herbert. Brings me to uh, the architect's newspaper and to the notion that it might well be high time to rest architecture from writing, to rest architecture writing from publicists and critics alike and restore some good old reportage from the street. In a world where so much writing on architecture is canned or florid and where there's an obvious abs absence of a dependable magisterial voice, though I think everyone here, maybe that totally contradicts that, uh, and, even attentions, and even with our attention spans too short for any of that anyway, there seems to be room for a, room for a snappy little rag like Architect's newspaper that's spry enough to pounce on the news and follow it through. Almost five years old and modeled on the British tabloid trade paper building design, Architect's newspaper doesn't try to kick buildings a la, a la Huxtable so much as circle them knowingly from the moment of their inception. And here it just... Uh, we often, we do follow stories uh, kind of repeatedly. I mean, our World Trade Center coverage is uh, uh, every little blip on the screen, we get it in the paper. Um, preservation is something. We, have, we do have quite a few reporters who, on staff who just attend all the meetings and bring back uh, the latest developments on the most uh, complex codes to preservation issues. Uh, pulling uh, Columbia strings is one that we're, we follow in almost every issue, what's going on in Morningside Heights and Manhattanville. The Chipperfield takes the Sterling Prize. Someone cut that out, sent it back to us, and said Neo Spear on it. So, <laughs> so. Okay. What we try to do with the paper is not only cover the new buildings, but to cover to cover the, the political and uh, community issues as well as the new buildings and also just the culture of architecture. And we often hear, for instance, this is a story about biomimicry because we were hearing that a lot of architects were just reading up on biomimicry and it seemed like a fascinating topic to track. And because the articles are short, we, don't, we can't offer depth, but we can offer a scope. Uh, here's our piece on, on Buffalo and all, all the uh, new projects that are going on to recover that city. And here, and here we have our, our review section is our kind of dabbling with more academic topics. And we have Dan Sujic on Martin Filler's collected essays and we have art exhibitions because we feel, truly feel that uh, the whole, that architects in general are broadly interested in the widest scope of the, the built and existed, the cultural environment where architecture goes up. And though it may seem like apples and oranges, the leap I've made from talking about architecture writing for the, for the broadest public to news writing for 10,000 or so converts who can get architects newspaper, is, it's a leap of faith that needs to be made if architecture journalism is to regain its role in influencing how the urban realm really takes shape. A job, a duty really, as Harold Ross of the New Yorker once felt was so urgent. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And kudos to everybody at Architects Newspaper for the concision of the writing and the, the kind of writing that has facts and ideas and not merely words. Really well done. Right. For all of us who know Robert Campbell's work, I know we've all been waiting eagerly to hear him speak. And, um, and so he is our, our, um, our uh, final speaker today. Um, you, I'm sure you know of him. He's near legendary or legendary in our circles. Um, a Pulitzer Prize winner for criticism in architecture at the Boston Globe. Um, he also writes for Architectural Record. Uh, he's the author of Cityscapes of Boston, An American City Through Time. Um, he's been an architect since 1975, so he's a practitioner as well as a critic. And a true Renaissance man, he's also a poet. So, Robert Campbell.
Uh, you're all waiting for me. I thought, the, I thought the hall would be empty by the time I got up here. I'm going to get some water. I have a great admiration for Ada Louise Huxtable. I would tell you her age, except that I think it might embarrass her, but she has just signed a new book contract uh, uh, for a book on the American Ranch House, which for her will be an entirely new topic, and she's just starting all over again once again. And I hope we may have, we should all do that well. I want to thank Mark Robbins, whom I met at the American Academy in Rome, and we've remained friends ever since then, for inviting me. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, have my, I should point out that my bifocals are broken. I am wearing only distance glasses with which I cannot read what's here. So you may see me kind of doing the Winston Churchill thing of gesturing with my glasses. It's going to be something very different. I come from Buffalo. Um, and uh, when you tell anybody in America, uh, other than perhaps people in Syracuse, that you come from Buffalo, they say, oh my God, the weather. And if you ask them more closely what they're thinking of, they think it's way up north. They think it's up around Hudson's Bay somewhere. The fact that it's about on the same latitude as Rome uh, would never occur to them. Um, it has always had kind of a bad press. Albert Hubbard the great arts and crafts uh, leader uh, who founded a, a community called the Roycrofters outside Buffalo in the suburb of East Aurora, some of which remains, he said in about 1910, you know they call it Buffalo because it's almost extinct. <laughs> God spoke for Buffalo, sent Albert Hubbard down on the Lusitania. Um, I first of all I want to get rid of my title, which was The Linear City. I have really nothing to say about that except that I'm fascinated by the fact that there has been for such a long time, since the Erie Canal in, that would be the 1820s, I would think, this industrial waistline, this belt across the middle of this state, all, uh, from, from Troy on the one hand, almost in Massachusetts, to Buffalo on the other end. Uh, they flourish together. Uh, they have, uh, have fallen together. Uh, and I just wanted to throw out half a dozen unrelated comments, and maybe they'll add up to something. The first one I want to say as someone from upstate, upstate New York is an undiscovered paradise. Very few Americans have any idea, and I think the problem is that it's called New York, and New York means Brooklyn and places like that. Uh, we have, or you have, I should say, uh, the Finger Lakes, incredibly beautiful. Uh, the Hudson River Valley, uh, once the most famous landscape in the country. Uh, the Cherry Valley, not known to many people, but also wonderful. The Adirondacks, the Thousand Islands. I mean, it goes on and on and on in this rather small area. Um, Edmund Wilson, the, the great critic, wrote a book called Upstate. He inherited a house uh, north of Syracuse, north of Watertown. Um, and he said that in his lifetime, and that would be about 1890 to 1960, something like that, Upstate New York had changed less than any other part of the United States. It is, and that is another thing that is remarkable about it, is much of it is frozen in time. And some of you may know Lilydale, which I guess still exists, a community of mediums down near Chautauqua, and Chautauqua is another incredible survival from the 19th century. Um, but Lilydale, uh, there's a kind of fence around the whole community, and everybody's a licensed medium. There will there'll be a sign on the house saying so-and-so, so-and-so, licensed medium. I've never inquired who was in the business of licensing <laughs> mediums. But they still, they're still at it, as far as I know. And uh, you go out into a kind of clearing in the forest, and there's a medium standing on the stump, and there are benches in front of him or her. And the medium says, lady in the third row, are you going on, you're going on a long trip. And she says, Fred, Fred, are we going on a long trip? We don't, so it's fun. <laughs> um, but if it's an undiscovered paradise, it's also an undiscovered paradise of architecture. My own hometown of Buffalo is trying to rebrand itself, to use the cur current terminology, as a museum of architecture. Um, and it is that. It has Sullivan, it has Richardson, it has uh, Stanford White over and over again, it has Daniel Burnham, one of his greatest buildings, it has Richard Upjohn, uh, and the WPA, running right through the WPA City Hall of the 1930s, which is one of the greatest of the, of the uh, art 
Deco, WPA style buildings. I had a tour of Troy. I gave a talk at RPI, and Alan Balfour, who's an old friend, um, gave me a tour of Troy, and I, and, I, and I saw the same thing there. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's falling apart, but it's just beautiful. And to the extent that it's coming back, RPI has something to do with that, and I'm gonna, gonna comment on that. Why did they all decline? Um, I think you have to know something about, to, to know what to do now, something about the history of these towns. Um, Everything came down the Great Lakes on barges, and that was primarily wheat from the Midwest to serve, uh, to serve the East Coast cities, New York and all the rest of them, and secondarily iron ore. And they came down the lakes on barges, and if you went past Buffalo, you went over Niagara Falls. So they all stopped at Buffalo, and they changed barges from the big Great Lakes barges to the small Erie Canal barges, and they continued on through the state. And that was the source of the prosperity, not only of Buffalo, but of this whole long line of towns all the way to Albany and Troy, where you hit the Hudson River and you have a natural water course. Hard to believe, but in 1900, there were more millionaires per capita in Buffalo than any other American city. I like to point that out today to people in Seattle and San Jose and say, watch out. <laughs> Anything can happen. Well, why was that? Um, because it was such a break point for the grain and the steel coming, or and the iron coming down, of course, industry began to develop around it. It developed its own steel industry. It developed its own um, um, whatever you do to grind wheat into bread. And I'm not, you all know the word, but I'm blanking on it. Um, and finally, what really put it over the top was Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls was the first important electrical generator in this country, and there was a huge tunnel all the way to Buffalo, and Buffalo called itself the City of Light because it was the first or at least the most American city with bright street lighting and all that. Um, what happened? Transportation changed, of course. Rail became much cheaper, uh, and trucks began to take over from the barges on the lakes. And then finally, the St. Lawrence Seaway cut through and absolutely demolished Buffalo as an economic entity by making now a waterway from the Great Lakes all the way to the Atlantic. Um, it was a simple thing like that. It was changes in transportation. Buffalo today has no economic reason to exist. Uh, all my high school friends uh, who are still in Buffalo are lawyers. Uh, and as far as, as far as I can tell, the reason for that is that every time a lawyer does something, he creates an equal and opposite need for another lawyer. <laughs> so they proliferate. They kind of take in each other's laundry. Whereas every time an architect does something, he does another architect out of a job. Um, what happens when the city begins to spiral down? Uh, first of all, there's a loss of jobs. Uh, Buffalo was uh, a tremendous industrial city, and it was largely Polish immigrants who ran the port, and then later African-American immigrants who came up during World War II for the, uh, uh, for the war uh, industries. Uh, all those jobs were lost. What happens when jobs are lost? Well, obviously, people become poorer, and housing prices drop, and the population begins to drop because they're not, there are no jobs there. When the population begins to drop, the housing, housing becomes a drug on the market. The housing prices drop. When the housing price drops, that attracts poor people into the city from elsewhere because they can buy cheap housing there. And so the city becomes poorer and poorer and poorer in this downward spiral. Spiral and taxes get higher and higher and higher because there are fewer people to pay them and more services to deliver uh, for the disadvantaged people. That's the spiral that Syracuse has gone through and all these towns have gone through. And it really has to be understood. I think it wouldn't be this way in some other countries. In America, we say every city is a tub on its own bottom and it can solve its problems within its walls or we're going to forget about it. Um, that's not entirely true. There have been hundreds of millions of dollars invested by the state of New York in the city of Buffalo, and further ones about to be, uh, about to be invested, the, the replacement of the Peace Bridge to Canada, for example. Nevertheless, for the most part, they're on their own. Um, a friend of my sister's best friend when they were 12 years old or something has just written a fascinating book about Buffalo and how the privileged class, the upper middle class, the country club set of which I was a member and so was she, uh, 
betrayed the city by refusing to accept political change that was necessary. It's a very interesting book and one that uh, I can't evaluate, but I think it's probably true. So what do you do? As far as um, I did a, uh, hosted a couple of conferences, one in New York and one in Chicago last year for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, we had become fascinated by the fact that town planners, city planners in American cities barely exist anymore. Uh, it's certainly true in Boston. What used to be active, aggressive, well-funded city planners with uh, uh, the, the gates to the gold coming down from Washington, I mean, we had the president, our senator was the president's brother, and the speaker of the house uh, was also from Boston, and money came in, and it was largely support, it was largely there to implement the urban design projects of the 1960s and a class of planners that then was, that then developed in order to uh, do those. The planning office in Boston now takes no initiatives whatsoever. All it does is look, is, is look at what developers bring and say, that's really wonderful. You can have those 10 extra stories if you build two classrooms in Roxbury. In other words, all the, all the city can do is spin benefits off private development. It does not attempt to control private development. It simply uses private development as the source of funding uh, for a city that, like every city, is impoverished. Boston has no sales tax. It has only a property tax. And enormous parts of the city, the largest percentage of any major American city, are off the tax rolls because they're owned by universities, by hospitals, or by the Catholic Church. Uh, so it's a very difficult situation. But that is different from Syracuse, and I wanted to, I wanted to be more general. What about universities? Um, in city after city, the university is the largest landowner and the largest employer. The University of Pennsylvania is both those things. Columbia and NYU are two of the three largest landowners in New York, and the list goes on and on and on. And they are effectively doing city planning. Uh, as we all know, for whether they're going to succeed or not, uh, Lee Bollinger and Columbia are moving into Manhattanville. Harvard is moving across the river to Alston, where it now owns more property than it owns in Cambridge. And there will be as big a piece of Harvard there as there is in Cambridge. Um, uh, and others, we heard about Ohio State today, that's an, an, a, Ohio State and Pennsylvania are, are universities that realized that they were maybe going to die because the city around them was dying uh, to the extent that it was. I know in, at, in Penn they actually said to each other, maybe we won't survive uh, 15 years ago. Um, and what they did was to move out into the neighborhoods around them and form co-development agreements with many different organizations in, those, in that region. And in the case of Penn, they built a new public school, which I thought was wonderful. Uh, just built it, gave it to the city, and about a third of the students uh, have some connection with Penn and, and two-thirds of the students don't. And they've been so successful in renovating and recharging the neighborhood around Penn that the problem now is gentrification. Uh, you can't win, you're, you're always going to go one way or the other. But we thought that was very, very interesting and we, uh, had these, as I say, these two conferences. Universities are the key, I think, and that's what you, that's what you should realize here in Syracuse. The university is the key to the regeneration of American cities, absolutely. There's nothing else comparable. Other cultural institutions are important, but nowhere near as important as the university. And the cities that don't have them aren't going to, aren't going to uh, grow back. And the cities that do have some chance uh, to develop what is now such a cliche, cultural buzz. You know, all these books have come out saying that uh, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the people with ideas, it's the people who generate culture. They're the ones that uh, make a city alive, and those are the ones you have to attract. That's absolutely true, I think. Um, but I would, I, in closing, I would just add one, one sort of set of comments. Everybody thinks that Buffalo has lost 50% of its population, and even its metropolitan area has not uh, done well at all. Um, and the feeling seems to be as money is poured into the city uh, from the state and from whatever other sources they can find, that somehow it should try to reconstitute itself uh, to the size that it was once before. There is no reason in the world why Detroit or Buffalo or Cleveland or any of these cities should again be the big heaps of capital and labor that they were in the past. We don't live in that kind of culture anymore and there's no reason why that should happen. Why not shrink? Uh, Buffalo today, with half its population, is a lot bigger than Shakespeare's London or Dr. Johnson's London. And Dr. Johnson said, when you're tired of London, you're tired of life. 
I don't think anyone has yet said, when you're tired of Syracuse, you're tired of... <laughs> there was an article in that I saw somewhere a few months ago that suggested that cities like Buffalo should, and I love this phrase, shrink to greatness. I think that's about right. All the old steel mills are now green fields down by the lake. Um, the slide that was shown of the one house in the empty lot, on the empty lot in Cleveland, that could have easily have been many, many parts of Buffalo. Um, on the other hand, the Delaware district, the district that has the Olmstead Brothers Park and Parkway plan and most of the upper income housing in town, has more than doubled uh, its prices, uh, although you'll still get a marvelous house there for practically nothing if you can stand to live in Buffalo. Uh, it has maintained its value and doubled its value. So a smaller city of the kind that we're talking about, the buzz of energy, the buzz of life, the university, it has a major university, SUNY Buffalo, and several other colleges like Canisius. Um, Boston, my own town, there are 40 universities and colleges in Boston, and that's not counting the ones that aren't in Boston, like Harvard and MIT and Wellesley and Tufts and Brandeis, you know, it goes on and on and on. And Boston is on the verge of another economic boom. It's had several since it began to recover in the 1960s. And it's all being, it's all being generated by MIT. MIT seems to generate a whole new economy every generation. They're, full with high, they're, they're finished with high tech now, and now they're doing nanotechnology. Do I know what nanotechnology is? No. But there are 70 biotech and nanotech private companies bellied up to MIT right now and others uh, coming along. So. Uh, that is, that's the future. I want to make a quick comment on uh, uh, writing, uh, writing criticism. I have some disagreements with my good friend Julie. Uh, some things she said, I don't like what Lewis Mumford wrote for the New Yorker. Lewis Mumford was a flaneur. He never talked to the architect. He never talked to the owner. He never talked to the user. He walked around on the streets and he saw what he saw and he uh, wrote, wrote his opinions about it. And it was really not very substantive stuff. His books are substantive. But his criticism, I think, is not. Uh, Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia, um, whom I've actually known since he was provost at Dartmouth, and I did some work up there, he said something I thought was very interesting. He said, you know, there are experts in the world, but the more expertise you develop in a particular subject, the more confused you become. Nobody had ever said that to me before. I thought, yes, of course I know that's true. It's the simple-minded people who know what they think. The experts go deeper and deeper and deeper, and it gets more and more and more confusing. And he said, the role of the journalist is to mediate between the confusion of the expert and the common sense of the general public. And uh, to translate back and forth between common sense, which we should still have pride and, uh, and a love of, I think, and a respect for, um, and the deep expertise that we should also have some, some, some respect for. I think that's the best definition of the role of a journalist that I've ever heard. Um, we're not consumer guides. It's very important to realize that. Every other critic is, tells you what restaurant to go to, what show to go to, what movie to go to, whatever to go to, uh, what book to buy. Uh, we're not consumer guides. Uh, people do not buy tickets to go and see museums, although they probably will the new one in New York that Julie was talking about, but not very many. Um, and so why, why do we exist? I think it's a question that architecture critics should ask themselves. I think we exist for no other reason than to uh, stimulate and participate in an ongoing, uh, unending conversation uh, about the, the world that we are building and what, how it should be. What, would be what, is, what is the best world we can make? Sounds pretentious, I guess, but that's what we're talking about. Um, and I have uh, one bias. Um, everybody is saying tonight, well, we got to talk about the economic and, and sociological and, and all the other causes of, of architecture. I believe that, and I try to do that. But what's more important for me is I write about the physical world. Nobody else in my newspaper writes about the physical world. They all write about economics and politics and sociology and all of these other sort of forces that are shaping the world. But I believe there is, and I'm sure we all do here, there is a set of, there is a, the physical world has its own set of values, regardless of those other underlying phenomena that may be helping to create it. There are good places and bad places, better places and worse places. And we should be willing to talk about the physical environment and evaluate it just on its own and not only explain why it is the product of complex underlying forces. 
And that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. Thank you. Robert, please join us at the podium and other panelists from the afternoon, please come up. And we'll have a few minutes of uh, Q&A. So if you have questions, I'm sure there are lots of questions. We'll entertain them. I think Mr. Campbell had a, a valuable point about uh, architectural criticism not being uh, consumer oriented. That uh, the topic of the, the meeting is, is about how the criticism can be uh, generative rather than, say, a uh, restaurant. Do I go to this restaurant to get a good meal? Do I go to this play to uh, entertain myself? Um, I think there's a connection for me in the difference between, <coughs> excuse me, between uh, automobile design and architectural design. Um, they're both design, but they're, they have a very different character to them. And writing for a consumer is a different kind of writing than uh, writing about design, for example, or the generative quality that, that writing can have for, for design. And I, I, Do you have a question to pose? I, I thought he made a very good point there. Mm -hmm. um, it just set off a thought for me. So, okay. just I'll Thanks. just add one sentence to that. It's very interesting to me that uh, consumers will generally want the latest thing when it comes to information technology or motorcycles or automobiles or whatever. They often don't want the latest thing when it comes to architecture and they there is an argument you can make that architecture should be a drag on change rather than, than an innovator of change because people want the solidity of memory uh, that, it, that it provides. I'm not making that argument, but I think it's very interesting that they want the latest in some areas and not the latest in others. Right. Okay. Yeah, Janet. Uh, I'm going to try and formulate this. I, I want to thank Dana very much for her introduction of the um, the satellite view is a trope of visualizing the world, and it's not the case that Google's the only provider of that medium, but they've become de facto the sort of synonymous with the world view. And I would like to hear the panelists um, discuss the issue of scale, literal scale, the zoom, the notion that was so beautifully captured in Powers of Ten of, of the perspective when you leave the individual building and you zoom up to like the city block, to the city itself and to entire land masses that you were able to track, for example, with the fires on the West Coast. Um, because I, I wonder whether that is, is really part of the, the difficulty of, of grappling um, architectural criticism in an age of world viewing. Well, let me start by just making it observation that I've been thinking about as I listen to the other panelists about how uh, privileged we are when we can really make criticism in our hometowns. You know, there's a richness to the way Sean and um, Stephen and Christopher now, you know, talk about their own cities. And it's a really curious contradiction, it seems to me, given how globally we're all trying to think now and how a particular city's import really is in the context of this much larger world that we focus our attention critically on these places near home. And it reminds me of that process in Google Earth where when you say, you know, uh, Moscow, it goes you know, and you go from your home site like in space and that ability to connect, I mean, it's, it's the genius of graphics, but I think there's an equivalent to that where people like uh, Stephen Litt can make a connection from Cincinnati to a much more global perspective by making the local 
relevant to the larger context. I think the larger context as a critical object is an extremely difficult one to attack. And you do that, I think someone else said, through you know, sort of point of view and perspective. And it's a, a particularly powerful to bring that through the perspective of people's hometowns, I think. Um, I just wanted to follow up. I, I think there's certainly a difference between talking about cars, but we can certainly learn from the car industry and in terms of what they do, life cycle assessment, etc. Um, is, is there any, uh, oh, my question would be, what is your take on looking at innovative strategies, be it in an urban context or be it just looking at architectural structures? Um, and Robert pointed out that a lot of people want the most modern technology if it comes to buying a car or other mm -hmm. gadgets in life, but if it comes to buildings, we're kind of struggling to convince them to invest a bit more into, you know, renewable uh, strategies, etc. So is, is, does that take a part in your work? Um, is that a re relevant point, innovation in general, and how that happens on an urban scale, for instance, or is that too general as a question? I don't know. It's a subject for a, for a whole conference, you know, not for, not for a short answer. Um, every building should be innovative. And I think when you look back at traditional styles, let's say Georgian, they were not traditional at the time they were being built. They were the latest thing. And they were dealing with whatever were the problems that were the problems of that time and the materials and so forth that were. And that is, that is, what, I, that is what I hope we'll always see, you know. Uh, somebody, somebody who is dealing with the real issues. Now, to go beyond that and sort of make a kind of work of art and a kind of star architect thing, I think star architecture is great, but nobody wants it in their neighborhood. You know, it's a tourist, it's a tourist kind of architecture. Uh, they'll go to Bilbao to see it, but they don't want to turn the corner on the way to Grandma's house and look at Bilbao. Um, so I think architecture in our time has divided into two camps, the one that builds the world and the one that makes the tourist attractions. Maybe intuitively as well, people have a better grasp of urban planning than we think. Cause they think of, arc they don't really think of building and architecture. They don't seize upon it as an image, but as part of their their place. And so they aren't treating them like cars. They're treating it in a larger context, naturally. I want to add one one response to that, which is that uh, I, I think uh, we've we've written a lot about a division between. Uh, uh, two camps in architecture, the, the avant-garde, the progressives, the innovators, and then the, the, the neo-traditionalist uh, uh, new urbanists, uh, people who um, flock around Andres Duwani, et cetera. I don't understand why we can't have the best of both, why we can't have good urbanism and good contemporary architecture. And I think the, uh, one of the problems is that we've been living with the culture of the isolated modernist object for such a long time. What's interesting to me about the University of Cincinnati Main Street complex as an experiment is that it brought uh, three or four top uh, innovative uh, practitioners together and said, you, you will make an ensemble around a public space, and the public space is the most important thing. I think to get, to get back to... Uh I think there's a connection, is this on now, connection between some of what Julie said and what Dana was saying. I wrote a piece about Google Earth about a year and a half ago, and my focus was much more on the, the sort of role of iconic imagery and how we're going from, you know, what Julie talked about in terms of the allure of images and renderings, mm -hmm. and now that's being practiced perhaps at the level of planning, and you can see this really, I think, in a couple of landscape projects, one in Toronto that mm -hmm. the firm West Aid has done where mm -hmm part of their, their waterfront plan is actually a, a little island in the shape of the, um, of the maple leaf, the Canadian flag. Um, and also, uh, of course, the way that Dubai has branded itself internationally with the kind of top down, it's become a logo that is visible um, from Google Earth. So um, I just wanted to get your thoughts about that. And also, the, I think that part of the, some of the other discussion is that the irony of Google Earth is that it's, it's mapping, it's about positioning a, a thing, you know, a, a building or a street exactly in its location on the earth, but it becomes a way to promote perhaps in terms of this iconography a, a placelessness in the same way that, um, that, the, that these renderings of, of buildings before they're even built um, are placeless. So I just wanted to kind of push the conversation in that direction. Julie, do you want to? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this, the, the 
It's a little bit related to what Stephen was just saying, this question about whether or not a global perspective brings placelessness or pushes for identity. Um, and it, it seems to me that um, you're right to say that there is this double force going on in that, in our sort of broader understanding of the you know, entire globe as some kind of giant tourist opportunity that places then compete with each other and they partly do that now through media like Google Earth and all of the associated accoutrements. And so you need to make distinctive ways of standing out in that much more, you know, it's, it's much more immediate, the comparative capabilities, than when you went to the bookstore and got London and then, you know, Madagascar and had to flip through each. You know, it's really right at your fingertips. So the it, bizarre versions of that, like Dubai, seem like one natural outcome. Um, I do think, though, that there is a way in which the um, ability to capture the whole makes it also possible, maybe this is just a half full version of you know what's going on, but makes it also possible to make more subtle differentiation. And so you know what's really intriguing, it seems to me, in Google Earth is that you kind of get into the backyards of places. It's like taking the train versus flying. You know, you actually see stuff you couldn't possibly see otherwise. And there's that part of familiarization that comes from studying, you know, everything from uh, residential patterns that you see from the air that you don't think anybody else is even paying attention to that then makes it so it seems as if you've discovered this unique thing about a city. And so there are there is that other way that it, it operates, at least I think with people who are somewhat familiar with reading drawings and photographs, that it allows you to get a sense of discovery into something that's much more subtle than the obvious. And I think that, um, and there is that split between it being an autocratic yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. in an autocratic way. Um, but it's also really democratic because yeah. traditionally the top-down view has been the privileged view. It's been the view that only right. kind of power structure can have, and now that's that's democratized. So, but it's interesting how the super real becomes unreal or irreal, and it becomes more just like a rendering and feeds into the notion of the artificial, pre-built imagery that seduces people a bit. Whether it's a tool for planning or not, I think it's still an outstanding question. I mean, I don't think we know the answer to that at all. It does allow you to look at relationships, it seems to me, in ways that we typically have not been able to look at in a public forum, and that's got to be good. But what that might have to do with planning, I, I'm not laying any bets yet. We had a question. It, it seems to me that it, it may be a tool for criticism, Next. though, uh -huh. uh, in, in the sense that uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, you know, readers and interfacing or, or mediating uh, and, and your question early on, Dana, about you know, what do we mean by writing uh, in the title of this, I think architecture, on the one hand, it begs a, a different kind of writing, but there, there's a way in which architects think that maybe produces a different kind of writing. And, and the kind of graphic interface that Google is, or, or the kind of projects that, that uh, uh, Janet showed earlier, mm -hmm. the big urban game, um, suggests a way to engage a different kind of reader that isn't uh, patronizing or you know going for the least common denominator that you know we have a different kind of reader today that, that doesn't read that interfaces right that interacts uh, that works graphically in real time you know the, the kind of internet model of what reading is um, and so we, we've had some discussion today about you know newspapers versus the internet uh, but it seems to me that architecture uh, maybe more than other disciplines mm -hmm. and urbanism uh, would gain uh, by some kind of a shift to a different model of reading and writing that would actually promote a more complex and maybe engaged understanding of what it is we do and how the design disciplines produce cities. Though I'm always amazed how you can presume how much the general public gets from things that they don't get. I mean, I'm still amazed with magazines, shelter magazines where Fred and I worked, where people would call and ask us about the products in the advertisement because they didn't even really realize that the articles and the ads were, were different. Mm -hmm. And the whole, and about uh, 
at the World Trade Center, those early Buyer Blender Bell things that were all were so rejected and everyone hates them and the public discovered. All architects knows that those were master plans too. Those weren't meant to be seen as buildings and yet we're always saying those horrible buildings. They weren't buildings. And uh, though it occasioned this great uh, uh, you know, public response, it's because the public didn't know better. They didn't understand at all what they were looking at. And no, none of us explained that. I'd like to comment on that because I was at that meeting when the five Buyer Blinder Bell uh, designs were shown. Um, and I went up to John Bell afterwards and, I, and, and, I, and before I could say anything, he said, I hope they'll turn them all down. The problem is the program. And of course it was. There's no was way you could make a good design by building 12 million square feet on a site that is two thirds the size of the Boston Public Garden. And still have room for a memorial. Supposedly. And still have room for a memorial. And a tea station. And I think it would be hard to get a group of critics in an academic context to say we shouldn't be reading. <laughs> um, and I would be the last person to say that. But I do think there's something really important in your comment, um, which might even enable reading more, because I think all of us believe that you know if you're if you're thoughtful and studious, you're going to get more from the thing. But there, there are ways that the media now make that kind of interactive boring in or drilling down into information much more possible in ways that, say, the New Yorker, just to take an example that's you know, here, is like, unless I'm getting on a plane and I have you know, three hours in a row, I hardly pick it up anymore. But with the internet uh, capabilities, and there's a way in which that could also track over time much more effectively, so you could follow stories in the way people were talking about in the first panel, so you could keep tracking back to information that you wanted. You know, there's, I think there are ways that new forms of interactivity and media would be extremely productive for urbanism and architecture. As well. I, that's one of the things we try to do at Architects Newspaper. In terms, of, I've, all, many of our cover stories are just two weeks later the same story and what has happened, especially with congestion pricing and Manhattanville. We always just kind of track the exact same stories as they go along. I can tell this reception is going to be really busy. Now we have one question in the back. Someone has been waiting very patiently. If you could just make one, it short, and then quick Julia, question. you had a. It just seems that the uh, value of architecture really happens after it's constructed. And over the next 5, 10, and 15 years, what value it brings, what it changes, what it transforms, what it accomplishes. And that until we start to write about whether it fulfills its mission, then we're always going to talk about it as an object. Mm -hmm and not what it really needs to do, which is to produce value over time. So how do, you, how do you evaluate architecture and critique it if you don't critique what it does over time? I'll try to, try to answer that. Uh, the first thing you should, I think you try to do as a writer is to see it not as a framed object and it's photography that has spoiled all of our ability to think about things except as framed objects and think of it as a member of a family of buildings that are creating a larger world and, and in which the outdoor spaces is as obvious, the streets, the squares, those are often the most important thing. That's answer number one, and I certainly, I think we all try to do that. Secondly, I've tried to start going back to buildings. Um, it takes at least two years for a new building to shake down. The HVAC system, when people move into a building for the first time, everything is wrong because they have adapted their work habits to, let's say it's a working building, to some other building. And uh, they, have to, they have to adjust. I went back to Frank Gehry's data center at MIT two years after it opened. And uh, it was a revelation to me. And uh, some of the people there loved it for reasons that had never occurred to me. And some of them hated it for reasons that had never occurred to me. Uh, although. It had not occurred to me that MIT would be suing the architect, but that's, that's a later <laughs> development. I've been writing a column for Oculus, which is the journal of the New York chapter of the AIA, where I go back and review buildings that are 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 years old. I've really been enjoying doing that, and I wish more publications had similar columns. Well, actually, in January, we're starting a column where we're going to revisit <laughs> buildings one, one to five years later. Mm -hmm. so. Good. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, in closing, I just have one, I have one comment and one, what I guess I call a plea. 
and the comment is, it was very interesting, uh, the subject matter was brought up, I guess, by Stephen and by you, Robert, about the university's role in helping, you know, kind of playing the new urban planners in many of these cities that are losing their densities in urban fabrics. But I couldn't, you know, the examples you've given, Stephen, you know, I think University of Cincinnati, personally, is a really bad example of how that's done by privatizing, taking the main street sensibility, putting it through the center of the campus and kind of privatizing and further sort of creating an enclave of the university within a neighborhood context of Cincinnati that's extremely disenfranchised. Um, I would say here in Syracuse, you know, one of the motivations of the Connective Corridor is that it, it's trying to inscribe a kind of figure of intensification within a city we know we can't completely rebuild. And the university's role, I think one of you used the word, you know, scattered acquisition. It's not scattered, it's actually strategically locating anchor points and catalyst, catalytic sites along and within this corridor. So I guess the plea would be, I mean, it was great having you all here and listening to what you're saying, but while you're in Syracuse, you know, the show's outside, Syracuse builds this, sort of take a look at all the things I think we're beginning to do right here. <laughs> Can I respond to that quick? Uh, the University of Cincinnati, uh, I asked them that, that question, and uh, they, they are dealing with the uh, ed developments around the edge as well to face uh, surrounding neighborhoods with housing, retail, et cetera. And so, yes, it's a one isolated project. It is in the middle of the campus and was a natural uh, pause in a, in a walking distance. We're talking about scale. Uh, if you draw a diagonal line across this 200 uh, acre uh, rectangle of the main campus, it's a natural place to stop. So that's why they did it. Anyhow, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for um, coming. I think there's a, there are several glasses of wine waiting for all of you, and our, and our participants certainly deserve it. But before we break, I, I was just sitting in the audience and looking at this group of people, and even though they're linked by the fact that they all write, they all really make strategic interventions in very, very different ways to different audiences. And they're all contributing to what we know about the city. Steve in his way about Cleveland, Bob Campbell for years about the city of Boston, Dana Cuff in an academic setting that also begins to tread between the university and the city. We've seen work at the scale of the room, the interior, and uh, the larger city. And I think about what um, both Bob Campbell and also Stephen Litt were saying about the importance of the university as a resource for both doing convenings like this, so both about changing the awareness, but also physically making investments that cross between the university and downtown. And, and Dana, I was very pleased that you hyped the image because I'm also fascinated by these arrows, these points, right, which was in fact, some of you may know, derived from uh, a fishing map for the Salmon River, which is just north of here. And so those arrows all originally used to point to fishing holes. And fishing holes are great because they're these areas of opportunity. And that's really the way we look at these underused sites, these places which can be occupied and can be used in remarkably positive ways. So um, you've all heard probably enough talking to last you at least for another hour. Um, please refresh yourselves. Please go out and uh, enjoy the exhibition, and you get a twofer tonight. There's an exhibition in the Warehouse Gallery, the work of artist Gary Schneider, uh, genetic portraits, which are quite remarkable, and, uh, and you'll see just in this kind of small uh, series of exhibitions here, the conflation between art, ideas about urbanism, the city, and culture. And once again, thank you all for coming. And thank you to our wonderful moderators, Johanna Keller and Jonathan Massey, and our participants. Thank you.